Hello everyone, my name is Maxim Ivanov, I'm the author of this course and I'm a firm believer that the best way of learning is by doing. This is why in this course we'll focus on building real React and TypeScript applications. We'll build six. Each of them is designed to teach you specific concepts and aspects of using React with TypeScript and let's go through them and see what you will learn. The first application is going to be a Trello board. Here you will be able to create new columns. Let's add a new one in review. You can add new cards, follow the course instructions. You can drag the columns and the cards. Don't let your eyes trick you. It might look simple, but you will actually learn a lot. First of all, you will learn all the basics. Creating React and TypeScript applications, defining components, typing props, specifying types for the state, using refs, using higher order components, using hooks, client server communication, providing styles for your components, using external libraries and even implementing drag and drop. But wait, there is more. There are still five applications to cover. In our second chapter, we'll learn how to test React and TypeScript applications. We'll use this Goblin store as an example. Here you can put products into the cart. Let's add a bunch of weapons. In the cart, you can review the products, remove some of them, review the total price and price of each element. Then you can go to checkout and buy the items. The form has validations, so it will show errors if you provide wrong values. If you look at the application source code, you will also learn how to normalize values. Let's pick the expiration date, CVV, and place the order. Here you can review what you've bought and go back to the main page. Here you will learn all about testing. You will learn how to create your own test helpers. You will learn how to test components, hooks, how to make testing your components easier, how to test context, everything you need to know to test React and TypeScript applications. The third app we're gonna build is the piano. And the best part is that you can actually play on it like on a real piano. This is where you will learn about React patterns, specifically render props and hooks and also general patterns like adapter. We will implement our own adapter pattern that will load instruments and provide different sound sets for our application. You might already know that higher order components or hooks are quite hard to type properly. And in this chapter, you will learn how to implement a bunch of different varieties of hooks. So it's a great practice if you want to learn them better. The fourth application is a drawing app. Here we will learn how to create an app where you can draw something. Let's draw a little house. One, two, three. Let's draw the roof. And now if we don't like it, we can undo and redo the strokes. Maybe add a little bit of color. Let's draw a tree. Let's add a trunk. And it looks good enough. Let's export our drawing. Great. Image, save. We can also save it as a project. House, save. And then we'll be able to load it and continue from where we left it. By building this application, you will learn how to use Redux. You will learn how to update the data in immutable way, how to use Redux Toolkit, that's the modern and actually recommended way to use Redux nowadays, how to use Redux DevTools and Redux Logger. Then you will learn how to use the Next.js framework. We will build a new website where we'll learn to use static site generation and server side rendering. We will also learn how to work with dynamic content by implementing the comments section. In this part, not only we will implement the application, but we'll also deploy it to Versal. So if you're new to web development, then after this part, you will know how to create, build and deploy websites using React and TypeScript. For the last application, I decided to spice it up a little bit and instead of creating a browser-based app like all the others, we'll create a console-based application. It's gonna be a GitHub manager. You will be able to work with issues, repositories and pull requests. For each of the entities, you'll be able to create a new one or list the existing ones. I think it's fun and unusual project to put on your resume. Anyway, I hope you will enjoy working through those exercises as much as I enjoyed designing them. And let's go. What is TypeScript? TypeScript is a typed superset of JavaScript that compiles to plain JavaScript. This is the definition from typescriptlang.org. TypeScript allows you to specify types for values in your code, so you can develop applications with more confidence. Using types in your code. Consider this JavaScript example. Here we have a function that verifies that a password has at least 8 characters. When you pass it a string that has at least 8 characters, it will return true. But someone might accidentally pass a numeric value to this function. In this case, you won't see any problems until you try to run the application. The number that you will pass as an argument won't have the length attribute. So when your app will try to access it, the code will crash. And the real problem here is that you will only know this after you run your code. With TypeScript, we can restrict the values that we pass to our function to be only strings. Here we say that the argument called password can only be a string, and only then we check that password length is bigger or equal to 8. If we call it with a wrong type, here we pass a number to it, TypeScript will give us an error. 
TypeScript can tell if we have an error in our code just by analyzing the syntax. That means that you don't have to run the program. Most code editors support TypeScript so that error will be immediately highlighted. Strings and numbers are examples of built-in types in TypeScript. TypeScript supports all the types available in JavaScript and adds some more. We will get familiar with a lot of them during the next lessons. But the coolest thing is that you can define your own types. Let's say we have a greet function that works with user objects. It generates a greeting message using provided first and last names. How can we make sure that this function receives an input of the correct type? We can define our own user type and specify it as a type of our user argument. Our function will only accept objects that match the defined user type. Here, for example, it will return hello, Maxim Ivanov. If we try to pass something else, we will get an error. Here we try to pass an empty object. And TypeScript will tell us that argument of type empty object is not assignable to parameter of type user, because empty object is missing the first and last name fields from the user type. Benefits of using TypeScript. First of all, it is preventing errors. As you can see with TypeScript, we can define the interfaces for parts of our program, so we can be sure that they interact correctly. It means that they have clear contracts of communication with each other, which will significantly reduce the amount of bugs. If, on top of that, we cover our code with unit tests, boom, our application becomes rock solid. Now we can add new features with confidence, without fear of breaking it. There is a research paper showing that just by using type language, you will get 15% fewer bugs in your code. There is also an interesting paper about unit tests stating that products where test-driven development was applied had between 40 and 90% reductions in pre-release bug density. On top of that, you will get better developer experience. When you use TypeScript, you also get better code suggestions in your editor, which makes it easier to work with large and unfamiliar code bases. Why use TypeScript with React? The revolutionary thing about React is that it allows you to describe your application as a tree of components. A component can represent an element, like a button or an input, it can be a group of elements representing a login form, or it can be a complete page that consists of multiple simple components. Components can pass the information down the tree from parent to child. You can also pass down functions as callbacks, so if something happens in the child component, it can notify its parent by calling the past callback function. This is where TypeScript becomes very handy. You can use it to define the interfaces for your components, so that you can be sure that your components only get props with correct types. If you have worked with React before, you probably know that you can specify a component's interface using prop types. Let's say we have a component called greeting. This component receives a prop called name, and we want to specify the type of this prop as a string. Then we import prop types and specify the type of the prop name as prop types string. We can also do this using TypeScript. In this case, we define a type, greeting props, and then we assign this type as the type of the props of the component called greeting. So, if you can do this with prop types, why would you need TypeScript? There are several reasons. You don't need to run your application to know if you have type errors. TypeScript can be run by your code editor, so you can see the errors as soon as you make them. Another thing is that you can only use prop types with components. In your application, you will probably have functions and classes that are not using React. It is important to be able to provide types for them as well. And also, TypeScript is just more powerful. It gives you more options to define the types, and then it allows you to use the type information in many different ways. We will demonstrate examples of this in the next lessons. A necessary word of caution. TypeScript does not catch runtime errors. It means that you can write code that will pass the type check, but you will get an error upon execution. Let's say we have a mess up the array function. It accepts an array of type array of strings or numbers and returns nothing. Inside of this function, we will just push a number to this array. Then let's say we define an array of strings and we call it just strings and it will have strings foo and bar. After we have this array, we call mess up the array with this strings array. And then if we try to get one of the strings from this array, and then call console log s to lowercase, and this is an allowed operation on a string, we will get a runtime type error, s to lowercase is not a function. This happens because the element with index 2 is a number. We pushed it inside of our function. And as a number, it doesn't have the to lowercase function. So if we look at the mess up the array function again, you will see that this function accepts an array containing elements of type string or number. Then we passed our strings array to this function, and TypeScript allows this because it thinks that types array of type string or number and array of type string match. 
Usually, this is convenient because an array that is defined as having number or string elements can have only string items. In our case, it allowed the bug to slip through the type checking. It also means that you have to be extra careful with data obtained through network requests or loaded from the file system. In this course, we will demonstrate the techniques that allow us to minimize the risk of such issues. Alright, in this part of the course, we will build our first React TypeScript application. We will bootstrap the file structure using Create React App CLI. If you haven't heard about it yet, no worries, I will explain everything you need to know. I will show you the file structure it generates and then go through each file and explain the purpose and why is it created. Then we'll create our components. You will see how to use TypeScript to specify the type of the props. We'll briefly discuss the difference between types and interfaces. We'll mostly work with the functional components because this is the most popular approach right now. We'll also discuss using JavaScript libraries in TypeScript projects. Some of them have types, type definitions provided by default and some of them will require installing some additional packages. Our application will store the state on the backend. So we'll also discuss how to use the fetch function using TypeScript. So in this chapter we'll cover creating components, defining props, using state, handling events, working with refs, styling components, using external libraries and making network requests. That's quite a lot so let's hurry up. In this module we are going to build our first React and TypeScript application. We are going to build a Trello clone. As you can see Trello is a Kanban Board where you can create new lists, new list, you can add items to it, new card, you can drag the lists and the cards around and we are going to do something similar but more simple. We also will be able to add new lists, new list, add new cards and move the lists and the cards around. We'll also connect our app to the backend, so even if you refresh the page, you will still have all the data preserved. We will bootstrap the file structure using the Create React App CLI. If you worked with React before, you might be familiar with it. If you haven't heard about it yet, no worries, I will talk about it more in detail further in this tutorial. There are a bunch of requirements before you start working on this chapter. First of all, make sure that you know how to use command line. On Mac you can use the terminal app and it's available by default. All the Linux distributions also have some pre-installed terminal applications. On Windows I recommend using Sigwin or Commander. And if you're more experienced then you can use Windows Subsystem for Linux. You will also need some code editor with the TypeScript support. I recommend using VS Code. It supports TypeScript out of the box. Make sure that you have Node.js installed. It should be version 10 or higher. On Mac and Linux, I recommend using NVM or Node Version Manager to install the Node version that you need. I'm going to show you how to use it in the next lesson. For Windows, there is another package called NVM Windows and it basically does the same. You also need to know how to use Node Package Managers. In this module examples, I'm going to be using Yarn, but you can use NPM if you want. And finally, you need to have some basic React understanding. Specifically, you need to know how to use components, how to create functional components, for example, and how to use hooks. In this example we are not going to be using class-based components, so this knowledge will be enough. If you don't feel confident, it might be worth visiting React documentation to refresh your knowledge. How to bootstrap React and TypeScript app automatically. In this lesson we will use an automatic CLI tool to bootstrap our project's initial structure. Why use automatic app generators? Usually when you create a React application you need to create a bunch of boilerplate files. First, you will need to set up a transpiler. React uses JSX syntax to describe the layout, and also you'll probably want to use the modern JavaScript features. To do this, we'll have to install and set up Babel. It will transform our code to normal JavaScript that current and old browsers can support. You will also need a bundler. You will have plenty of different files, your components code, styles, maybe images and fonts. To build them together into small packages, you will have to set up Webpack as your application bundler. Another example of a bundler is a parcel, parceljs.org. Then there are a lot of smaller things. Setting up a test runner, adding vendor prefixes to your CSS rules, setting up a linter and enabling hot reload, so you don't have to refresh the page manually every time you change the code. It will be a lot of work. To simplify the process, we'll use the Create React App package. It is a tool that will generate the file structure and automatically create all the settings files for your project. This way, we will be able to focus on using React tools in the TypeScript environment. How to use Create React App with TypeScript. Navigate to the folder where you keep your programming projects and run Create React App. We do it using npx create react app dash dash 
template. We select the TypeScript template and then you specify the name of your project. In our case, it's going to be Trello clone. All right, now app is created. Let's look at the command that we've just used. Here we've used npx to run create react app without installing it. This is the recommended way to use create react app. Read more in their getting started guide. Create react app.dev docs getting started. We've specified an option template TypeScript. So our app will have all the settings needed to work with the TypeScript. The last argument is the name of our app. In our case, Trello clone. Create React app will automatically generate the Trello clone folder with all the necessary files. CD to Trello clone and open it with your favorite code editor. Project structure generated by Create React app. Let's look at the application structure. If you've used Create React app before, it will look quite familiar. We have a bunch of files and folders here. Let's go through the files and see why we need them. We'll do a short overview and then we'll go back to some of the files and talk about them a bit more. First of all, the files in the root. Here you have the readme file. This is a markdown file that contains a description of your application. For example, GitHub will use this file to generate the HTML summary that you can see at the bottom of the projects. Then we have the package JSON file. This file contains metadata relevant to the project. For example, it contains the name, the version, and optionally the description of our app. It also contains the dependencies list. It has all the external libraries that our app depends on. You can find the full list of possible package JSON fields and their descriptions on the NPM website in the docs for the package JSON. Let's take a closer look at the dependencies. You might see that some packages, like for example React, have corresponding types packages. Those types packages contain type definitions for libraries originally written in JavaScript. Why do we need them if TypeScript can parse JavaScript code as well? The problem with JavaScript is that often it's impossible to tell what types the code will work with. Let's say we have a JavaScript code with a function that accepts the data argument. TypeScript can parse this code, but it has no way of knowing what type the data attribute is restricted to. So for TypeScript, the data attribute will implicitly have the type any, and this function will accept basically any value. This type matches with absolutely anything, which defeats the purpose of type checking. If we know that the function is meant to be more specific, for instance, it only accepts the values of type string, we can create a DTS file and describe it there manually. This DTS file or a file with an extension .d.ts will contain the types for the specific module. This file name should match the module name we provide the types for. So in this save data function example, if this function comes from the save data.js module, we will create a save data.d.ts file. We'll need to put this file where the TypeScript compiler will see it, usually in its src folder. This file then will contain the declaration for our save data function. Declare function save data and then here we specify the type of the data attribute and then we set the return value to be void. This is another way of saying that this function returns nothing or undefined or as you can see, void. We could create a package with this file and publish it to npm. This is what all those add types and then some name packages are. They contain files with the DTS extensions. And those DTS files contain the declarations for the types of those libraries. It is a convention that all the types packages are published under the types namespace. Those packages are provided by the definitely typed repository. When you install JavaScript dependencies that don't contain type definitions, you can usually install them separately by installing a package with the same name and add types prefix. Versions for types and their corresponding packages don't have to match exactly. Here you can see that React DOM has version 17.02 and the types for it have version 17.0.11. Apart from dependencies, this package JSON file also contains the scripts block that helps us work with our application. We can launch it, build, test, or eject. And those scripts should be familiar to you if you already worked with the Create React App package. Let's move on to the next files. Here we have the package log.json. Alternatively, you might have yarn.log file. This file is generated when you install the dependencies using yarn or npm, and it's gonna be in your project root. This file contains resolved dependencies versions along with their sub-dependencies. It is needed for consistent installations on different machines. Thing is, you don't really have to read or especially edit this file. In fact, it's harmful, so don't edit it manually. But it is still good to know what this file is doing. Next, we have the tsconfig.json file. 
and this file contains that TypeScript configuration. We don't need to edit this file because the default settings work fine for us. You can tweak it later when you gain more confidence with TypeScript. And finally we have the git ignore file. This file contains the list of files and folders that shouldn't end up in your git repository. So we're done with the files in the root, let's go to the folders. First we have the public folder. The public folder contains the static files for our app. They are not included in the compilation process and remain untouched during the build. Read more about the public folder in the Create React App documentation. In this folder we'll have the index.html file. This file contains the special div with id root that is a mounting point for our React application. This folder also contains the manifest.json file. And this file provides the application metadata for the progressive web apps. For example, the file allows installation of your application on a mobile phone's home screen, similar to native apps. It contains the app name, icons, theme, colors, and other data needed to make your app installable. Next, we have a bunch of icons. We have the ICO format and two bigger icons with PNG extension. These are icons for our application. For example, the ICO is a small icon that is shown on browser tabs. Also, there are bigger icons logo 192 and the logo 512. Those are referenced in the manifest.json and will be used on mobile devices if your app will be added to the home screen. Last file in this folder is the robots.txt and this file tells crawlers what resources they shouldn't access. By default, it allows everything. If you need, you can read more about robots.txt on the robots.txt website. We're done with the public folder, let's go to the src. Files in this folder are processed by the webpack and will be added to your app's bundle. This folder contains a bunch of files with .tsx extension, like app.tsx, index.tsx, and then we'll add more files like that. This extension means that those files contain JSX code. As you can see, JSX is HTML-like syntax used in React applications to describe the layout. You can read more about it in React Docs. In a JavaScript React application, we could use either JSX or JS extensions for such files. It would make no difference. With TypeScript, you should use .tsx extensions on files that have JSX code and .ts on files that don't. Here, for example, setuptests.ts. This is important because otherwise there can be a syntactic clash. Both TypeScript and JSX use angle brackets, but for different purposes. For example, let's say we have a constant text and we want to make the value that we assign to it a string. If we don't do it, and we don't use this angle bracket operator here, then the type of the text constant is gonna be hello TypeScript, because string literals can be used as types. And often that's not what you want, so you will use this angle bracket operator to specify that the type of the text constant is just a string, so a broader type. But the problem with this operator, as you already can see, is that it is using angle brackets, just like the JSX elements do. And in order to let TypeScript know what to expect, how will we use these angle brackets, we need to specify the file format. So if the file format is TSX, then TypeScript will assume that, alright, any angle brackets are gonna be JSX elements. Or, in case of .ts files, it will know that there is not gonna be any JSX, it's gonna be type assertion. You can read more about this issue in the TypeScript documentation. Now let's talk about the specific files in the src folder. Let's start with the index.tsx. It is the most important file in this src folder, because it is an entry point for our application. It means that Webpack will start to build our application from this file, and then will recursively include all other files using the import statements that lead to other files. So let's look at the contents. We have a bunch of imports, and first of all, we import React. We use it to set the strict mode in our application. We import React DOM to be able to render our React component tree into the root element. As you remember, it is in the public index.html div id root. Let's go back to the index.tsx. We import the styles. This file contains styles relevant to the whole application. So we import it here in the entry point. Then we import the app component. And after that, we import the report Web Vitals. This module can be helpful if you want to measure your app performance. It is explained in full detail in the Create React App documentation. As it is not specific to TypeScript, we are not going to focus on it. After we got all the imports, we render the app using the React DOM render. 
Note that by default the app component is going to be wrapped into a React strict mode element. React strict mode mostly checks that no deprecated methods are being used. Also, all those checks are performed only in development mode, and it is a good practice to wrap your app into react.strict mode. React.js documentation contains the continuously updated list of the strict mode functionality. We're not going to change much in this file, so let's move on to the app.tsx. If you use modern Create React app, this file won't be very different to the regular JavaScript version. And thing is that currently you don't really need to import React neither in JavaScript or React files, so we can safely remove this file. But previously you had to import React module, because internally all those JSX elements are just React namespace function calls. So div, for example, is react.createElement div, header is the same for header, and so on. With the modern React versions, they removed the necessity to import React from React. Apart from that, this file doesn't have much difference from the JavaScript version of this file in the regular Create React app setup. The next file that might be interesting to us is React app and DTS. This file references the types from React scripts. And if you command click on them, it will open this file where you will see type declarations for a bunch of image type modules like JPEG, GIF, and BMP, for example. Here you might think, why do we need type declarations for the style sheets and images? And thing is that TypeScript does not even see the static resource files. It is only interested in files with .tsx, .ts, and d.ts extensions. With some tweaking, it will also see the .js and .jsx files. So let's get back to the app app.tsx and here we're importing the logo from the logo.svg. Unless we would have those type definitions, TypeScript would have no way of telling what type will this logo here have. And if you look at the type definitions for the SVG, you will see that there are two options. If we are using the default import, it's gonna be a string. Let's verify it. We go to app.tsx and check the type of logo. And yes, indeed, logo is a string. Alternatively, we could have used the named import and then it would be called React Component. Let's change that, React Component, and then we'll be able to render it as a React Component. Let's check the type. And it is a component that accepts all the props of uh, SVG element. Let's undo the changes and get back to the definitions. And this is where this React Component is defined. Here it says that this React component constant should have type of function component that receives the SVG props of an SVG element. And this ampersand here means that among with the other props, it also should accept the title of type string. Now, this code might be too hard to understand right now before we discuss TypeScript generics and intersection types. So I suggest you go back here and check if you can understand it better after we discuss those topics later in this course. Other than that, in our SRC folder, we also have the tests defined for our application, the logo asset that we were just discussing, and the helper module that helps us properly set up the tests. Let's make sure that everything works correctly and launch our application. Open the terminal and run yarn start. Or if you use npm, you can run npm run start. After your app is built, it should open the localhost port 3000. And if you see the same spinning React logo, then everything is fine. Before we start writing the new code, let's remove the files that we are not going to use. Go to the src folder and remove logo svg, app css, and app test tsx. Now open src app tsx and change the default export, remove the export default app, to the named export, export app. Remove the imports and the layout. For now, we'll just return null. Now go to index.tsx and change the import here. Import app from app. If you use VS Code, configure it to use workspace TypeScript version. Otherwise, if your global TypeScript version is older than 4.1, you will get an error that React refers to an UMD global, but the current file is a module. Here is a relevant Stack Overflow answer. You can find the link to it in the text version attached to this video lesson. To, th to select the TypeScript version, open the command palette, Choose the select TypeScript version command and choose use VS Code version. Add global styles. Now let's define the styles to apply the, to the whole application. On the top level, on HTML, we'll need to define box sizing border box and we also add it to all the elements. This directive tells the browser to include padding and border elements in its width and height calculations. 
it makes it much easier to lay out your components. We also make the HTML body and root elements to take the whole height of the screen vertically. How to style React components? There are several ways to style React elements. We can do it using regular CSS files, including CSS modules. We can manually specify the element's style property, and we can use external styling libraries. Let's briefly talk about each of the options. Using separate CSS files. You can have styles defined in CSS files. For example, in our application, we have index.css that we import in the index.tsx file. To use them, you need a properly configured bundler like Webpack or Parcel. Create React App includes a pre-configured Webpack that supports loading CSS files. React Elements accept class name prop that sets the class attribute of the rendered DOM node. As a result, you get a div in this case with class set to styled. You can also pass the CSS rules through the style property. For example, let's say we want to style this div. We can declare the object inline, then we won't need to specify the type for it. But a better practice is to define styles in a separate constant. For example, here we define them in the button styles. Then we can apply them to our element by providing them inside of the style prop. As a bonus, we get autocompletion hints for CSS property names. It is important to note that we are not using real CSS attribute names. In React, the style properties are in camel case form. Here, for example, the background color is in camel case instead of being background dash color, like in real CSS. This is crucial to remember when you work with React CSS properties. You can also use external styling libraries. There are a lot of libraries that simplify working with CSS and React. I like to use styled components. Styled components allows you to define reusable components with attached styles like this. Here we define a button component that is a styled button. We specify background color, border radius, border and box shadow, and then we can use it like a regular React component. Here we render button with text click me. We can also provide mouse events to it, and overall it will work just like the regular button. In our Trello application, we are going to use the styled components approach. Prepare the styled components. We'll begin by creating a bunch of styled components so that our application looks good from step one. First, install the styled components library. Yarn, add, styled components. I'm gonna use a specific version, 5 to 1. Inside of the src folder, create a new file, styles.ts, and here try to import styled from styled components. Import styled from styled components. Oh, and you will get TypeScript error. Let's see what it says. It says that it couldn't find a declaration file for the module styled components. TypeScript errors can be quite wordy, but usually the most valuable information is located closer to the end of the message. To fix this particular issue, we will need to install the missing types. Yarn, add, add types, styled, components, 519. A lot of issues related to missing types can be fixed by installing a package, starting with add types prefix and then the name of the package you're trying to use. Let's look at the app and decide what styled components will be defined. So here we have an app container. It will help us to arrange the columns horizontally. It is going to wrap the whole application. Then we have the column container. It is a visual representation of a column. It will have gray background and rounded corners. Inside of the columns, there will be a column title. It will make the column title bold and add paddings to it. And we'll also have a card container. This component will visually represent the card. Go back to the styles.ts and let's start with the app container. Expert const app container equals styled div. The syntax that we are using here is nothing related to TypeScript. It's actually basic JavaScript where you can pass template strings as arguments directly without using the brackets. Let's add the styles. This component is responsible for aligning the columns horizontally. So it will have display flex and align items flex start so that the arrangement of items starts from the left side. We set the background color to be blue, set the flex direction to row, and make this element to take 100% height and width. Then we add a little bit of padding. 20 pixels is enough. Style component functions accept strings with CSS rules. And it's very convenient because instead of passing the object properties where we have to rename each property to a camel case, we don't need to do it here. 
It is basically just the regular CSS styles that you would use in your CSS files. Let's proceed and define the styles for the columns. Export const column container. It's another style div. It should have static width 300 pixels and flex grow 0. It also has a bit of uh, padding and a small border radius. Each of the columns will have margin right 20 pixels. And just in case, we also define the minimum height of each column. It should be 40 pixels. Define the column title. Export const column title. It is also going to be a div, style div, with padding 6px, 16, and 12. Define the font weight as bold. Now let's define the styles for the cards. There is going to be only one styled components needed here. Export const card container. It's going to be a styled div with background color white, cursor pointer, small margin bottom, a bit of a padding. It should also have max width, similar to the width of the columns, border radius, and a box shadow. If you want, you can copy the styles from the attached code example. Now go to src apptsx and render everything together. So in our app, we'll now render an app container. Inside of it, we'll have a column container where we'll have column title saying to do and three card containers. The first one should say first item, the second one should be second item, and the third, third item. Launch the app, yarn start. React should open your app in the browser automatically. If it doesn't happen, navigate to the URL suggested in the console. Here you should see a column saying to do with three cards, first item, second item, and third item. Create column components. In this section, I won't explain how React components work. If you need to pick this knowledge up, refer to the React documentation. Make sure you know what props and state are and how lifecycle events work. We'll start with a column component. Create a new file in the src folder, column.tsx. Here we'll import column container, column title, and card container from the styles. Define column props, type column props. For now, it's going to be an object that will contain only the field text. It's going to be a string. We'll use it to display the column title. Export const column. Here we define the column component. We'll use the text from the props and we specify the type of the props. Column props. We don't use functional component or FC type to define the column component because we don't need the children prop to be part of the props list. Return the layout. Column container. Inside of it we render column title. Here we render text that we got from the props. Then we render card container. And here we'll mock the cards for now. Generate app scaffold and then to others with text learn TypeScript and begin to use static typing. So this component will receive the text prop and render it as a column title. Update apptsx to render the column component. Column text equals to do and import it from the column module. Remove the unused styles and we are done. How to define props? You can use a type or an interface to define the form of your props object. Most of the time types and interfaces can be used interchangeably. We'll get to some differences later. In our column component, we define the props as a type. Or in other words, we defined a type with field text of type string and assigned an alias column props to it. Now if we say that some variable has typed column props, it will mean that this variable is an object that has a field text of type string. This is what we did with the props of the column component here. To use this type for our component props, we specified it as a type of our functional component first argument. We also immediately destructured this object to get the field text from it. By default, all the fields you define on your types are required. It means that if the field will be missing, you will get a type error. To make the field optional, you can add a question mark to it. In this case, TypeScript will conclude that text can be undefined. How to accept children prop? There are several ways to define the children prop on your props type. Use the FC type for the component. The first option is to use the React functional component or its alias, ReactFC, as your component type. Here the functional component or FC, it is basically the same type because FC is an alias to functional component type, and it's a generic type that receives the props to which it will add the children prop. Use props with children. 
Alternatively, we could use the React props with children type that can enhance your props type and add the definition for children prop. Here is how React props with children type is defined. It's a generic type that gets a type variable p and then it combines this p or props because you're supposed to pass the props to this type with an with a type with field children of type react react node. The letter p is called a type argument. It works similar to function arguments. We can pass an actual type with which this type will be used instead of this letter. So for example, we define column props, we use props with children to do it, and we pass an object with a field text string to props with children as letter p or as type argument p. Then the resulting type of column props is going to be an intersection type between object with text string and object with field children that is optional of type react react node. The ampersand combines two types into one. In TypeScript this is called a type intersection. Here having the type combined from two other types is almost the same. In a lot of cases it's practically the same as having a type having both of those fields. You can also define the children prop manually. Here is the type column props, where we manually defined an optional prop children of type react react node. Create the card components. Create a new file, src, card tsx. Here we define the props for this component, type card props. It will have text of type string. And then we define and export the card component itself. Export const card. Here we get the text from the props. Set the prop types, card props, and return card container that we import from the styles that renders the text. Now let's render the card inside of the column component. Instead of the card container, we can now render card and set the text prop. Text equals generate app scaffold. Repeat it for other cards. Card learn TypeScript. And the last one begin to use static typing. We can remove the card container import. And now we have the card component. Component for adding new items. In this lesson, we're going to create a component that will allow us to create new lists and new cards. It's going to contain a button saying add new card or add new list, depending on what are we going to be adding. We'll be able to click on it, set the name of the item, test card, and then add it. As you can see, it's going to have two states. Initially, it's going to be a button that says plus and then whatever we are adding. If you click on it, the component renders an input field and another button saying create. When you click create, it will trigger a callback function that will pass as a prop. Let's begin with the styles for the button. Open SRC, styles TS, and add a new type for the add item button props. It's going to have only one prop, dark, that is going to be optional and it's going to be a boolean flag. This flag will control if we're rendering the button on the light or the dark background. So here dark is false and here dark is true. Dark means that we're using darker font. Now define and export the add new item button styled component. Export const add item button equals styled button add item button props. Specify the styles. You can copy them from the code example attached to this lesson. It's important that you provide the add item button props here because otherwise there would be an error in the color field where we are trying to use those props. As you can see, we can check the type of this field and TypeScript will calculate it correctly based on the add item button props. Now let's create the add new item component. Here we'll also learn to use state. Create a new file, add new item.ts. Define the add new item props. Type add new item. Here we'll have an on add function that's going to receive text of type string and it's going to return nothing. Then we'll have the toggle button text. Toggle button text is going to be a string and a flag dark that will pass to our styled component. It's a boolean flag. Next we define and export the add new item. Export const add new item equals a component that will receive props of type add new item props. And I have a typo here. The type should be called add new item props, of course. Inside of this component, we'll need to have a state that will show or hide the form. 
const show form set show form it's going to be a state we use the react use state hook and default value will be false so by default we just show a button showing the plus sign and inviting the user to create a new item import use state from react and destructure the props const on add toggle button text dark equals props alternatively you could destructure them right in place so you could just write curly braces here and then put all the props inside of them now we have all those fields we can check if show form then here we'll render the form otherwise we return the button add item button we pass the toggle button text as a child to the add item button we pass the dark prop dark equals dark and on click is a function that will call set show form and it's gonna pass true to it all right now we have a simple component that has a state that has a show form state that controls if we're rendering a form or the button when you work with use state hook in typescript you might need to provide the type of the state because use state is a generic hook so you can say boolean but with uh, such simple types like boolean we don't really need to do this because typescript already correctly derives the type of the state for us because we've passed in the initial value we'll define the form later right now let's already start using the add new item open app tsx and add this new component below the column add new item pass in the toggle button text it should be plus add another list and on add we pass in a function that will call a console log saying item created let's format the document go to the column and add this component there as well add new item toggle button text equals plus add another card on add is a function calling console log saying new item added also pass in a boolean flag dark now if you launch your app your start you should see this nice little button that will use to add new lists and cards new item form component first let's define the styles for the form inside of the src style ts define a new item form container export const new item form container that is a styled div with max width 300 pixels display flex flex direction column width 100 percent and align items flex start that's gonna be our container that will have the input and the button let's define the styles for the button export const new item button it's a styled button with green background three pixels for the border radius we want to have nice rounded corners we remove the default border and the box shadow set the text color to white add a little padding and align text by the center and then we also want to style the input export const new item input is a styled input where we also round the corners a bit remove the default border and set a custom box shadow add a little bit of margin so that we have some space between the input and the button add some padding and set the width to 100. now let's create the new item form component inside of the src create a new file new item form tsx define the new item form props type new item form props here we only want to accept the on add function let's define it it's going to receive text of type string and return nothing because inside of it we want to perform a side effect now define the new item form component export const new item form is a function here we get the on add from the props of type new item form props we're gonna use controlled input element so we're gonna store the state for it const text set text is use state with default value of empty string and then we define the layout here we combine all the components that we've just defined in the styles new item form container will wrap the new item input and the new item button saying create 
the new item input should have value text from the state and on change we're going to get the event and store the text from the event target value the new item button should have on click handler where we call on add with the text here we didn't have to provide any type for the event argument of our on change callback because typescript derives this type automatically here it shows that it's react change event html input element now let's update the add new item component go to add new item and instead of this comment inside of the if show form block return new item form we pass on add that will receive text and then we call on add text and set show form false now we can launch our app yarn start and when you click on the add item button you should see this form and you should be able to add new items test test create and it should close the form automatically focus on an input to focus on the input we'll use a react feature called refs refs provide a way to reference the actual dom nodes of the rendered react elements there are several ways you can define refs in react we're going to use the hook version inside of your project create a new file src utils use focus.ts inside of this file import use ref and use effect from react the idea of this hook is that we'll store the reference to the actual html input element in the reference and then when component gets mounted so the input is already rendered we will call the method focus on this input element define the hook expert const use focus equals a function where we get the ref use ref we can provide a type of this ref because use ref is a generic hook the type of this particular element is html input element and by default the value is null then define the use effect use effect pass an empty array as a dependency array and then call ref current focus here we use optional chaining because theoretically current can be undefined though in our case i wouldn't be checking for that because i would assume that if the component is already mounted then the element is definitely there and now return the ref so we use the use ref to get access to the rendered input element typescript can't automatically know what the element type will be so we need to provide the actual type that we did here in html input element then in the use effect when the component using this hook will get mounted will trigger the focus method on that element if you pick the type of the ref you will see that it is react ref object the ref object type is actually an interface with the type argument t in our case we specified it to be html input element this type is used to describe the field current that can have type t or null note that it's marked as read only so you can't reassign the current field manually if you try to do it you will get an error cannot assign to current because it is a read only property it happened because we provide a default value null to our use ref you can have a mutable ref as well just don't pass null as a default value or specify null as a possible ref type in both cases you will get mutable ref where you can reassign the current value let's test it so right now we have ref object that has immutable current if we pass or null and check the ref type again we will have mutable ref object this is done so that refs are more predictable if you want to use the ref so that react handles it automatically for example we are going to pass ref to a to an element and we are not going to change the value of the current field manually then we probably want an immutable ref otherwise if you will use a ref as a way to store values related to the component that you don't want to observe that shouldn't trigger re-renders then you can use a mutable ref now let's use our use focus hook go back to the new item form get the input ref using use focus and pass it as a ref to the new item input all right let's try to launch the app yarn start if you click create another card or add another list you will see that the input is focused automatically submit on enter let's make the new item form component to submit the input on enter key press as well so that the items could be created either by pressing the create button or by pressing the enter key to do this we are going to add an on key press handler 
to the text input in the new item form component. Inside of the new item form, create a function handle add text is going to process an event of type react keyboard event and the type of the event is going to be html input element because we know we're going to listen to this event on the input inside of this function we check if event key is enter we call on add from the props and pass in the text from the state now we can add an on key press to new item input here we pass the handle add text and that's it here we use the keyboard event from react you can find all the available event types in the react documentation and types for them in react type definitions right now we already passed the on add callback to add new item and it's gonna end up in the new item form so if you launch the application and try to add new list test list and then press enter you should see the log with the text you've passed to this form by the way if you pass console log directly here and then try to do the same test test log you won't see any logs so make sure to wrap your console log into a function this is happening because react overrides the default console log behavior when rendering your components Add global state and business logic using the use reducer. Soon we'll begin to add interactivity to our application. We will begin implementing drag and drop and we'll use React DD library and we'll use state management. We won't use an external framework like Redux or Mobex. Instead, we'll throw together a poor man's version of Redux using the use reducer hook and React context API. Before we jump into the action, I will give a little primer on using use reducer. Use reducer is a React hook that allows us to manage complex state like objects with multiple fields. The main idea is that instead of mutating the original object we always create a new instance with desired values so when used in react react calls an action creator usually as a reaction on something that user does with the interface for example clicks on a button and then we call an action creator that returns an action we send it to a reducer using dispatch method the reducer generates a new state using the old state value and the action that we send to it and then sends the new value to react and then the cycle repeats what is a reducer? A reducer is a function that calculates a new state by combining an old state with an action object. So here, for example, we had a state that is an object with field name and the value Fred. We receive a new action. This means that we will call our reducer. It will happen implicitly under the hood of use reducer, or if you use the Redux, then it will be happening inside of the Redux internals. But in the end, we will just call this reducer function. The action will contain two fields. It is always required to contain the the type field that contains the type or name of the action in our case it's set name and the payload in our case the payload is the name field that contains the new name for the state and then the reducer returns a new object where name has the value of action name field and we get a new state usually a reducer looks like this it's a function it must be a pure function so we cannot perform any side effects inside of the reducer it receives a state that's going to be the old state and the action we often the switch statement is used and it checks the action type and depending on the value of action type field it returns different kinds of new state objects here we get a new object with all the fields and values of the old state and then we override the updated field with action payload if we cannot recognize the actions we return state without changing it how to use use reducer you can call the use reducer hook inside of your functional components on every state change your component will be re-rendered the basic syntax is the following you call use reducer pass in the reducer that will process the state for you and the object representing the initial state in return you will receive the state that is going to be observable and it will cause component re-renders and the dispatch function the dispatch function is going to be used to send actions to the reducer what are actions actions are special objects that are passed to the reducer function to calculate the new state. Actions must contain the type field and often they also contain some field for the payload. The type field is mandatory and some actions don't even have any payload at all. To send the actions to the reducer, we use the dispatch method that we get from the use reducer hook. Usually, instead of creating the actions directly, we generate them using special functions called action creators. Here is an example of one. It is a function that receives some arguments. Usually they will end up in the payload. Here we accept the name as an argument and then pass it to the 
the action object. After you have the action creator, you can use it to dispatch actions like this. Instead of passing an object, you call the action creator and pass the result to dispatch method. Let's look at the counter example. The code for the counter example is in the code 01 first app use reducer folder. Open app TSX. And here you should see the counter reducer. The reducer can process increment and decrement actions. This is TypeScript, so we must provide the types for the state and the action. State is going to be an object that contains the account field of type number. And action is a union type. And union types are often used to define actions in TypeScript, because then, depending on the action type field, value, we can already know the type of the payload. Here we don't have any payload, so I cannot demonstrate this, but later in the next lessons, you will see how convenient it is to use the union types to define your actions. Now, we also have two action creators, one for the increment and another for decrement. They just return the objects with pre-filled type fields. If we look at the component, then you'll see that we use the use reducer, where we pass in our count reducer, and the default state. We get the observable state and the dispatch method. When we click on the minus or plus buttons, we call dispatch method with the decrement and increment actions. If you launch and open this up, you should see a counter where you can press plus or minus and it will change the count value. Implement global state. First, let's define a data structure for our application to make it available to all the components through React's context API. Inside of the SRC, create a new folder, state, and here create a new file, app, state, context, tsx. Here we'll import, create context, and use context methods from React. We'll use create context to define the app state context, and the use context hook to define a helper hook to access the context data easier. Define the types for the application state. Type task is going to be an object with fields id, string, and text, also a string. So tasks will have IDs and text values. Then we'll define the lists type. List is an object. Each list will also have an ID of type string. It will have text. That's going to be the title of our list, string. And it will have an array of tasks. Tasks, it's a task array. And now let's define an expert the up state type. Expert type up state is an object with field lists, that is an array of type list, list array. The root type is upState and it depends on list and task types. We use arrays to store the lists and the tasks. They will allow us to move the items around because arrays pr preserve the elements order. Both lists and tasks have unique IDs that will allow us to identify them. And also they both have the text field so that we will be able to render the text inside of the task and list components. I decided to go with the terms task and list for the data types. And for the components, we will actually use other names. So task will become a card and list will be represented by the column component. This way, there should be less ambiguity. So if I'm mentioning a task, then we're talking about the data. And if I'm mentioning a card, then it's definitely a component. Now we have the types. Let's define the data. For now, we'll just hard code it. Const app data will have type app state, and it's going to be an object with an array of lists, lists array, where we'll have objects representing tasks id 0, text to do tasks, and it's going to be an array with one item that has id c0, text generate app scaffold. We will have three lists by default here, to do, in progress, and done. And each of them will contain one task. Now let's define the context. First define the type for the context props. Type up state context props. It's an object that has an array of lists. Lists, list array. And it will also have a method get tasks by list ID that receives an ID of type string and returns an array of task items. Define the upState context itself. Const up state context equals create context. And it is a generic type, so we can pass the type of the value we're going to be passing through this context. Up state context props. And we will pass the default value here. 
Keep in mind that it will only be used if you don't wrap your application into the app state provider. So we can omit it. To do this in TypeScript, we pass an empty object and then cast it to app state context props. Now let's define the context provider. Export const app state provider. We're going to use the FC type here so that we can use the children prop here because the FC type defines the children on the props of your component. So we'll save some time by using FC instead of defining the children type on our app state provider props ourselves. Now let's get the list from the app data const lists equals app data. Define the get tasks by list ID const get tasks by list ID equals a function that receives an ID of type string and then returns lists find. Here we find the list by comparing the list ID to the ID provided through the arguments. And if it exists, then we get the tasks. And as a fallback, we'll have an empty array. Now let's return the layout. Return. Here we'll wrap the children into app state context provider. App state context provider. Inside of it, we render the children. And then we pass the value. This value will be propagated through the whole React application or whole React subtree that we will wrap into this provider. But we will wrap the whole application to this provider so we can say that it will provide the value to the whole application. Now we'll pass the lists and the get tasks by list ID there. And we can format the document. Now go to index.tsx, import app state provider from state app state context and wrap the app into this provider. Now we'll be able to get the lists and the get tasks by list ID function from any component. Now let's create a simple hook that will make it easier to access the data from the context. Go back to app state context and export const use app state. That's going to be a custom hook where we return use context app state context. So inside of this hook, we get the value from the app state context and just return it. We don't need to specify any types here because TypeScript can derive them automatically based on app state context type. You can verify this by hovering use app state and checking what is the return value here. And it's app state context props that we've defined right after the hard coded data. Now open SRC card, update the props. We will need ID of type string along with the text. Go to the column TSX, add the ID string to the props here as well. Import use up state from state up state context. Now inside of the column component body, we can get the get tasks by list ID function const get tasks by list ID equals use up state. Now we can get the tasks by using the column ID. This column ID is the same as list ID. So const tasks equals get tasks by list ID. And we pass in the ID. The ID comes from column props. Now instead of using hard coded card elements, we can remove it and use a map tasks map. For each task, we're gonna return a card where text is gonna be task text key is going to be task ID and ID also is going to be task ID. Go to apptsx, import use app state from state app state context, get the lists const lists equals use app state. Now instead of the hard coded column, we can map through the lists. Lists map for each list. We're going to render a column where text is going to be list text, key is going to be list ID, and ID is going to be list ID as well. Now launch the app, yarn, start. When you open the app, you should see your columns with the uh, cards populated with the data inside of the hardcoded app state.